Pacific Fury is a two-player game about the Solomons campaign in World War II, from August to November of 1942. One player controls the Japanese forces, and the other player controls the forces of the United States. The game lasts only four turns and starts on the 7th of August of 1942, after the 1st Marine Division of the United States landed on Guadalcanal and took control of the airfield there, soon renamed Henderson Field. The game includes the following components. One 16.5 by 11.5 inch cardstock map, which shows the playing areas and various charts, tables, tracks and boxes needed for play. 50 one-sided half-inch counters showing the ships that participated in the campaign. Three one-sided five-eighth of an inch counters, which are the turn marker and two operation markers. The game also includes one eight-page rules booklet and one cover sheet. The game requires one six-sided die to play, which is not included. All units begin in their respective bases. For the United States, their base is the Espiritu Santo box, and for the Japanese, the Truk box. The map is divided into four playable sea zones. These are the slot, Iron Bottom Sound, which is the sea zone that surrounds the island of Guadalcanal with Henderson Field, which is the crucial airfield that both sides will be fighting over, the Eastern Solomons, and the South Pacific Ocean. There are special rules that we will cover as to what kind of task forces can operate in each of these sea zones. All units in the game have the following information. The name of the unit, the combat factor, the defense factor represented by one or more anchor icons and ships with no anchor symbols, such as transports, have a defense factor of zero. And in the case of aircraft carriers, their combat factor is always in blue and aircraft carriers show one or two aircraft symbols. Those with two are fleet carriers or CVs and those with only one are light carriers or CVLs and only the Japanese have light carriers in this game. The winner of the game is determined at the end of turn four and for that we use the initiative track. Yes, I know it says truck, that's a typo. The side with the initiative marker at a value of plus one or more on its respective side of the track is the winner. But if the initiative marker ends in the zero space, the final result is a draw. And historically, the US won with a plus two initiative. The game lasts four turns and each turn is divided into the following phases. The first phase is the initiative phase. Here it is determined which side will have the initiative for the turn. Then comes the event phase and we determine an event that applies only to the non-initiative player. This phase is skipped during turn one. The third phase is the task force phase. Here both players secretly form their task forces with the non-initiative player doing it first. The next phase is the initiative player's operation phase, where the initiative player can sortie, move, or attack with one of his task forces. Next is the non-initiative player's operation phase, where he can sortie, move, or attack with one of his task forces. Then steps four and five are repeated six more times to complete seven operation rounds. And after that is the last phase, the return phase, where all task forces are returned to their respective bases. And we're about to start this uh, game, this two-turn demonstration, and we'll start with the setup. 
Game turn marker goes in the first box, turn number one, August 1942. The Hornet is a fleet carrier for the Americans that comes in as a reinforcement in turn two. The initiative marker starts face up in the U.S. number one box of the initiative track. Place the U.S. operations marker in the number one operation box. And we do the same with the Japanese operations marker. Three Japanese ships start in the reserve box, and these are the monster battleship Yamato and the light carriers Hiyo and Junyo. Now we place all ships in their respective bases. For the United States, it's the Espiritu Santo box, and for the Japanese, the truck box. Now, because these boxes are small and uh, I intend not to use them in this video demonstration. I have uh, made uh, larger boxes that uh, I'm keeping off the map. So I'll be using uh, these uh, boxes. This is the Espiritu Santo box, which is the American base. And this is a custom made truck box, which is the Japanese base. Both of these displays are available for download if you're interested in Pacific Fury's page in Board Game Geek in the file section. Let's see the starting units for the Americans in this game. They have three fleet carriers, the Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp, and three battleships, the North Carolina, the Washington, and the South Dakota, and 12 cruisers, and all except one have a defense factor of one, and this is signified by the anchor symbol printed on the counter. The Australia, which is actually, of course, an Australian ship, has a defense factor of zero, as signified by the lack of the anchor symbol. Now let's take a look at the starting Japanese forces. They start with two fleet carriers, the Shokaku and the Shuikaku, and two light carriers in the Shuiho and the Ryuho. They have two battleships with a surface strength of three in the Mutsu and the Nagato, and four battleships with a surface strength of two in the Kirishima, Hiei, Haruna, and Congo. They start with 12 cruisers with a surface strength of one and a defense of one, and three additional cruisers with a surface strength of one but a defense of zero. Because the Japanese start the game without the initiative, they are given both transport units. And to mark the hits of the task forces and individual ships, we will be using these numbered markers. These don't come with the game. These are actually hit markers from SPI's terrible Swift Sword. So we start with turn number one, and the Japanese bear the brunt of the attack. Henderson Field, which is the airfield on Guadalcanal, is under American control, signified by the initiative marker being on the American side of the initiative track in the number one box. And the first phase is the initiative phase, where we determine which player will have the initiative. And the player that has the initiative controls Henderson Field, and the non-initiative player gets the two transport markers that are used to uh, take Henderson Field away from the other player. Now, in the first turn, as we stated, the Americans have control of Henderson Field. They are the initiative side. The Japanese are the non-initiative player, and the Japanese have the two transports. The next phase is the events phase, where the non-initiative player rolls one die and consults his side of the events table. All events can only occur once, with the exception of the U.S. event heavy bomber. And in the first turn, there is no roll on the events table. So that starts in turn number two. The next phase is the task force phase, where each of the players secretly select their ships and form task forces that are placed, each task force, in a different operations box. And the non-initiative player does that first. And in this case, the Japanese is the non-initiative player. Of course, in a real game, each player would not be able to see the composition of the other player's task forces, nor their units on their bases. So let's start with the Japanese phase. And the Japanese will form 
a bombardment task force, and that is a task force that doesn't have any carriers or transports. And that bombardment task force will be composed of the battleships Kirishima, Hiei, and the cruisers Chokai, Takao, Maya, and Ashigara. So we place these units in a stack, and remember the American player would not be able to see this, and we place the stack face down in the number one Japanese operation box. Next, the Japanese will form a carrier task force composed of the fleet carriers Shokaku, Shuikaku, and the cruisers Miyoko, Atago, Tone, Susuya, Chikuma, and Kumano. And the Japanese will place this task force, which is a carrier task force, on the number two operations box. Now the Japanese will form an amphibious task force comprised of the battleships Mutsu, Nagato, Haruna, Kongo, and the cruiser Nachi, and one of the transport units. And this task force is placed in the number three operations box. Next, the Japanese will form a special task force composed of one transport unit which represents the Tokyo Express, which is the use of destroyers to transport uh, troops in an invasion. So this transport is the Tokyo Express, and it goes in the number four operation box. And the remaining ships, the light carriers Suijo and Ryujo, and the cruisers Haguro, Aoba, Kinugasa, and Furutaka will form a carrier task force, which will be placed in the next box of the operation track, which is number five, and having no more ships to place, boxes six and seven are left empty. So now it's the Americans' turn to form their task forces. They have observed the Japanese forming his task forces, but not knowing the composition of the same. So now, we go to the Espiritu Santo base to see the American task forces that will be formed. The Americans begin by forming a bombardment task force composed of the cruisers New Orleans, Louisville, Indianapolis, Pensacola, and San Francisco. And this task force goes in the number one operation box. Next, the Americans form a carrier task force comprised of the Carriers Enterprise, Saratoga, the battleship North Carolina, and the cruisers Chester, Portland, Chicago, and Northampton. And this task force is placed in the number two operation box. And finally, the Americans form another carrier task force comprising the carrier Wasp, the battleships Washington and South Dakota, and the cruisers Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, and Australia. And this task force is placed in operation box number three. There are no more American ships to place, so boxes four through seven are left empty. So now we start seven operation phases for each of the sides, starting with the side with the initiative, which is the Americans, and uh, they can execute operations with their task forces. They have none on the board, so they will start by sorting the task force that is in the number one box. And in this game, task forces have to enter the game in the order of the operation boxes. So the task force in box number one is now to be placed in one of the four C zones. Now we know that this is a bombardment task force composed of five cruisers. And uh, the choices are the South Pacific Ocean, where any ship can be placed, any kind of task force can be placed, and Iron Bottom Sound, because the United States has the initiative, and therefore it can place task forces directly in Iron Bottom Sound. Now, in this game, no carrier task forces can be placed in Iron Bottom Sound or the slot. And because this is a bombardment task force, 
we will be placing it in iron bottom sound. And that concludes the American first operation. Now the Japanese have seen the Americans move ships into iron bottom sound, and the Japanese will also sortie the task force that is in their number one operations box. And this is also a bombardment task force that has uh, four battleships with a surface strength of two and one cruiser. The Japanese have various choices. They can move these ships by sorting into the Eastern Solomon's Sea Zone. However, surface combat cannot occur there, so therefore a bombardment task force, which is a task force that has no carriers, can only be attacked there. However, the Japanese may move bombardment task forces directly from their base to the slot, and they can also put the Tokyo Express there move it directly from the base in what is a sortie operation. And that's what they will do here. This bombardment task force will go to the slot. And that concludes the first Japanese operation. Now we move on to the second American operation. The Americans can sortie the task force that is in the number two box and have it enter the map, or they can conduct operations with the task force that they have already in Iron Bottom Sound. And if they conduct operations with that task force, then the remaining task forces in the operation track would be shifted to the right. So you will never have task forces that will be surpassed by the operations marker. But the Americans have their main carrier task force here with the carrier's enterprise and Saratoga. So that task force will sortie. And because it is a carrier task force, it cannot move into the Iron Bottom Sound, but it will be moved to the South Pacific Ocean area. And that concludes the second American operation. Having observed the Americans place a sizable task force in the South Pacific Ocean, the Japanese have a good reasons to believe that that is uh, the principal American carrier task force. The Japanese have a choice here in their second operation, which is coming up now. The Japanese can sortie the task force that is in their number two operations box and have it enter the map. And this is the main Japanese carrier task force with the Shokaku and Suikaku. And that, because it is a carrier task force, would be uh, forcibly entering the Eastern Solomon's Sea Zone. Now, the Japanese have a choice. The Japanese can also conduct operations with the bombardment task force they have in the slot. And they could have that task force move into Iron Bottom Sound, and that would cause combat, surface combat, to occur with the task force that the Americans have there. And that's what the Japanese will do. So the Japanese move their task force from the slot into Iron Bottom Sound, and now we have a combat situation. And we start by revealing the task forces on both sides. The Japanese have six ships, the Americans five, the Japanese are attacking, they have two battleships, so they have an advantage in surface combat factors. So combat in this circumstance is mandatory, it is surface combat, and uh, we will fire the attacking units first, followed by the defenders units, but combat is considered simultaneous, so both sides fire. We determine the amount of hits that each side causes on the other, the hits are assigned by each of the sides to the enemy ships that will take them, and then we apply the hits. And uh, receiving ships, the ships that receive hits, are either damaged or destroyed. So we start with the Japanese, and we will start rolling from left to right, from the Kirishima onwards until the Chokai, and we roll 1d6. 
if the result is equal or less than the surface combat factor, that is the number of hits that that particular ship causes on the enemy task force. If it is greater than the combat factor, that ship uh, missed and does not cause any hits in this first round of combat. There can be up to two rounds in each combat situation. So we start with the Kirishima, we roll 1d6, and the roll is a 5, no hits. Now we roll for the Hiei, and the roll is a 2, so the Hiei inflicts two hits on the American task force. We will keep tally of that with these markers, which we will place beside the American task force. Now we roll for the Ashigara, and only a one will produce one hit. The roll is a four, the Ashigara misses. Now we roll for the Maya. A six, not even close. Now we roll for the Takao. A four, that's also a miss, and finally, we roll for the Chokai. Another four, that's a miss. The Japanese only inflicted two hits in this first round. So now it's the American task force's turn to fire back. All ships have a combat factor of one, and we start with the New Orleans. A six, and that's a miss, the Louisville. Another six, no hits, the Indianapolis now. The roll is a three, no hits. Now to the Pensacola. Pensacola scores one hit with a die roll of one, and we place a one marker on the Japanese task force. Now we finally roll for the San Francisco, and that's a four, no hits. So now we apply the hits, the attacker applies hits first. So the Japanese has to apply the two hits it obtained on the American force. The Japanese assign a hit to the New Orleans and one to the Louisville. That means that in the ensuing die roll on the sunk table, because the number of hits is equal to the defense factor of each of the ships, there is a 50% chance of sinking the ship with a die roll of four to six. Alternatively, the Japanese could have placed both hits on one of the ships, in which case uh, the number of hits exceeded then the defense factor, and uh, with a die roll of two through six, that one ship would be sunk. But the Japanese here want to see if they can sink both ships with uh, two lucky die rolls. So now the Americans, defenders, have to assign their sole hit, and they will assign it to the Ashigara, which has a defense rating also of one, they could have assigned it to one of these battleships, but because the number of hits is less than the defense factor, they would need a six to sink one of those battleships, which is a tough proposal. So they will go with the 50-50 shot on the Ashigara. Here we see the sunk table. If the number of hits is greater than the defense factor of the target ship, a two through six, that's an 83% chance, will sink the ship. If the number of hits is equal to the defense factor, it's a 50-50 proposition with a four to six to sink. And if the number of hits is less than the ship's defense factor, only a six will sink the ship. So we start rolling for the targeted American ships. We roll for the New Orleans on the sunk table. A four through six will sink it. The roll is a five and the New Orleans is sunk and it is permanently removed from the game. In this game, the sinking of ships does not earn victory points. Victory points are not used in this game at all. Uh, it, uh, victory is determined by the control of Henderson Field at the end of the game. So now we roll on the sunk table for the Louisville. Four through six will sink it. The roll is a six and the Louisville is also sunk. The Japanese managed to sink both targeted U.S. cruisers. And now it's the Ashigara's turn to meet her fate. A four through six will sink her. The roll is a five and the Ashigara is also sunk. And so the tally of this first round is two U.S. cruisers sunk and one Japanese cruiser also sunk.
And now, before moving to the second round, both players have the option of leaving the C zone and returning to base, starting with the defender. The defending Americans have taken a beating. Two of their five cruisers are sunk, and they're not going to risk the remaining cruisers that they have, so they will head back to base. And we place the cruisers face down in the Espiritu Santo box. They will not see any more action in this first turn. Now in this game there's a forced return rule in which even the victorious side has to return to base. Now the attacker has to return to base after a second round of combat or after the first round of combat if there are no targets for a second round. And there is a target for a second round which is Henderson Field which is here in Guadalcanal and Henderson Field can be bombarded and that's what the Japanese task force will do. So now the Japanese have a chance to disrupt Henderson Field which is important because only a disrupted Henderson Field can be invaded by a regular amphibious task force and the Japanese have one of those coming up on the operations track. We roll one die for each of the bombarding ships if the die is equal or less than the surface combat rating, that ship scores a number of hits indicated by the die, and Henderson Field is disrupted if the total number of hits is equal or greater than the number in the box of the initiative track, which is currently one. So just one hit will disrupt Henderson Field. So we roll for the Kirishima, and the Kirishima rolled a 1, which is just enough to disrupt Henderson Field, so we don't have to roll for the other bombarding ships. And to mark the disruption of Henderson Field, we invert the initiative marker to its backside. So now Henderson Field is disrupted, and it cannot act as a carrier, which it can when it is fully operational. Having concluded the second round of combat, the Japanese Bombardment Task Force is forced to return to base, so we place it face down in Truk. And that's the end of the second Japanese operation. And because the Japanese did not sortie the task force corresponding to the uh, box where the operation marker was, we shift each one of these task forces one space to the right. And now that's the end of the second Japanese operation. And we're moving on to the third U.S. operation. And there's a task force there that can enter play. That has the carrier Wasp, two battleships and three cruisers. And uh, if it enters play, it's through the sortie operation. And the Americans also have their main carrier fleet in the South Pacific. So the Americans could, in lieu of uh, sorting with uh, the task force that is in Operation Box 3, it could move this uh, task force. And the only place it can move, as per the rules, is to the Eastern Solomons. These are the only two sea zones that can have carrier task forces. Of course, by moving this carrier task force here, it would force any Japanese units that enter the Eastern Solomons to engage in combat. The Americans notice that the Japanese have a sizable task force about to enter the game in Operation Number 3. Now, depending on what kind of task force this is, is the uh, C zone where the task force can move. If it is a carrier task force, it has to move or sortie here to the Eastern Solomons. If, is it a, if it's an amphibious task force, that is one with a transport unit, it also has to sortie to the Eastern Solomons. Now, if it is by any chance a bombardment task force, it can sortie here into the slot and the advantage the slot has for the Japanese is that it is not adjacent to the South Pacific Ocean Sea Zone. And that means that uh, an American carrier task force cannot conduct airstrikes against units in the slot because 
It is not adjacent. The Americans decide not to engage in combat or force a combat by moving their task force to the Eastern Solomon. So, in this third operation, they will sortie this other carrier task force, which is also placed in the South Pacific Ocean. And now the Americans have two task forces there. Of course, the Japanese player doesn't know what kind of task forces they are. He may assume it's one big carrier task force and a bombardment task force, but it may be two carrier task forces. Now we move on to the third Japanese operation. They have their main carrier task force there, and it will enter play, it will sortie. So the Japanese player will place his principal carrier task force, the one with the Shokaku and Shuikaku, in the Eastern Solomons, and that is the Japanese third operation. We move on to the fourth American operation. No more task forces to sortie or enter the map. The Americans have two task forces in the South Pacific Ocean. The Japanese have a sizable task force in the Eastern Solomons. It can be a large uh, carrier task force. It could also be an amphibious task force, in which case in its next move, it could move into Iron Bottom Sound and take Guadalcanal. So in any event, the Americans can take no chances here. The Americans have two carrier task forces. Their principal carrier task force is this one. So they will announce an airstrike of that carrier task force against the Japanese task force in the Eastern Solomons. Consequently, both task forces are revealed. The Japanese have a carrier task force also, so that means they will be firing back. So let's line up the ships. So the Americans conduct an airstrike against the Japanese task force in the Eastern Solomons, which happens to be a carrier task force, which will also then conduct an airstrike on the American carrier task force. We start by comparing the airstrike rating of the attacking Americans to the anti-aircraft rating of the defending Japanese. The Americans have an airstrike rating of 4, as denoted by the two aircraft symbols on each of their carriers. The Japanese have an anti-aircraft rating of 6, because they have 6 ships that are not aircraft carriers. So, uh, the Americans receive no uh, bonus to their combat factors. Now. The Japanese have a combat air patrol value of two because they have at least one fleet carrier. So two hits will be subtracted from the hits uh, caused by each of the American carriers. And we roll first for the Enterprise. The Enterprise rolled a five, which is uh, higher than its combat factor of four. So the Enterprise misses and causes no hits. Now we roll for the Saratoga. Saratoga rolled a two which is uh, less than its combat factor. That, so that is two hits, but we have to reduce that by the combat air patrol value of two, which is zero, but in this game it is reduced to a minimum of one hit. Consequently, the Japanese task force suffers one hit, and now the Japanese return the favor with an airstrike on the American fleet. The Japanese have an airstrike value of four as denoted by the aircraft symbols on their aircraft carriers. The Americans have an anti-aircraft value of 5, so the anti-aircraft value is higher than the airstrike value. There's no bonus or addition to the Japanese carrier combat strength. In terms of combat air patrol, the Americans also have at least one fleet carrier, so the hits caused by each Japanese carrier will be reduced by 2. So we start and we roll for the Shokaku. The Shokaku rolls a 5-2, which is higher than its combat uh, factor of 4, so it also misses, as the Enterprise did. Now we roll for the Shuikaku. The Shuikaku rolled a 1, that's 1 hit, minus 2 is minus 1, but it is reduced, the number of hits to a minimum of 1. So the American Task Force also suffers 1 hit, and now we allocate the hits starting with the attackers. The Americans apply their sole hit to the Miyoko, which has a defense strength of 1, as denoted by uh, 
one anchor symbol there. That means that uh, there will be a 50-50 chance of sinking the Miyoko when uh, the Americans roll on the sunk table. Now the Japanese apply their hit. The Japanese will take a risk here. They will apply it against the Saratoga that has a defense rating of 2. That means that the Japanese need to roll a 6 to sink the Saratoga. So now we go for the rolls on the sunk table, starting with the roll against the Miyoko. On a 4, 5, or 6, it is sunk. The roll is a 4, and the Miyoko goes under. Now we have to roll for the Saratoga. Only a 6 will sink her. And the roll is a 2, so the Saratoga is not sunk, but it is damaged, and we place it in the box for the next turn because it only suffered one hit. Notice that the Japanese decision of applying the hit to try to sink the Saratoga, which is a long shot, is not a bad idea in the sense that it forces the Saratoga to leave in this first round. And now we go to the second round and the defenders decide whether to stay or to leave to base. And the Japanese, sensing an advantage, decide to stay. So this being an airstrike, the Americans have the option of uh, conducting a second round of airstrikes against the same target or a different target. And if the Americans conduct a second round against this target that has two aircraft carriers, the prospects of uh, receiving severe damage are high. So the Americans will decline a second round of airstrikes. And because the Americans decide not to execute a second round, there are no targets for a second round, and that is one of the causes for the attacker to return to base. In this game, every time the attacker performs any type of combat, initiates any type of combat, he will have to return his task force to base. Consequently, the American task force returns to Espiritu Santo and we place the stack face down. The Japanese carrier task force suffered one hit and that causes it to return to base. In this game, only a defending task force may remain in a sea zone after combat and only if it suffered no hits. We place a Japanese carrier task force in its base at Truk also face down. Now we move on to the fourth Japanese operation. And the situation is that the Americans only have one task force on the map at the South Pacific Ocean Sea Zone. In addition, Henderson Field is disrupted. What that means is that a Japanese amphibious task force, if it reaches Guadalcanal, it will take Henderson Field. And the Japanese have three task forces that are pending entering the map, and the one in Operation Box 4 is an amphibious task force. However, amphibious task forces have to enter through the Eastern Solomons, so the Japanese will sortie the task force in Operation Box 4 into the Eastern Solomon's Sea Zone. On to the American fifth operation. So what do the Americans do now? If they attack the newly arrived Japanese task force in the Eastern Solomon's, and that happens to be a carrier task force or a bombardment task force, the Americans will have to leave the map at the end of the combat, and that will leave the Tokyo Express and possibly an amphibious task force, the path open to Guadalcanal. On the other hand, if the newly arrived Japanese task force is an amphibious task force, and the Americans do not attack it now, that task force can move in the next turn, in the next operation, into Guadalcanal and capture the airfield. So the Americans will take a chance and uh, they will pass this turn. They will 
assume that that newly arrived task force is not an amphibious task force. And uh, therefore, by passing, the Americans still have the ability to attack any of the other task forces that may enter the map in the next operations. Now we move on to the fifth Japanese operation. The Japanese could sortie the Tokyo Express, represented by this lone transport unit. They will not do that. Of course, you've been watching the playthrough from both sides, and you know that the Japanese and the Eastern Solomons have an amphibious task force. The Americans guessed wrong, so the Japanese announced that they will move this task force into Iron Bottom Sound for the purpose of executing a landing at Guadalcanal. So the Japanese have to reveal the composition of their task force now. And the Japanese show that they have a task force composed of four battleships, a cruiser, and a transport unit. This is an amphibious task force. And the only way it can land those transports at Guadalcanal is if Henderson Field is disrupted as it is. Therefore, the transports land at Guadalcanal and we remove the transport unit. Now the initiative is shifted one space in the phasing player's favor for each transport removed. Remember that you can form also an amphibious task force with two transport units, but this one only had one. Therefore, the initiative marker now moves to the zero box on the initiative track and the remaining ships must return to base. So we take the task force and place its ships face down at Truk. And because we did not sortie the unit that was in the operation box corresponding to this operation, these two task forces are shifted one space to the right. And that concludes the Japanese fifth operation. Americans have two operations left in this turn. Now we go to the sixth operation. And from a glance at the Japanese operation track, it seems that the Tokyo Express is coming up next in the next Japanese operation. The Tokyo Express enters the game through the slot. And then in the next move, it can move into Guadalcanal. And if the Japanese land the Tokyo Express transported units into Guadalcanal, the initiative will shift one more space in the Japanese favor. So the Americans definitely want to avoid that. The Americans have a big problem. They have a carrier task force, that is the WASP, a battleship, and some cruisers in the South Pacific Ocean. Carrier task forces can only enter that sea zone and the Eastern Solomons. And the Japanese have lined up, ready to enter, what appears to be the Tokyo Express and one task force after that. The Tokyo Express enters the game through the slot. The slot is not adjacent to any of those sea zones where carriers can enter. Therefore, the American task force cannot cause any damage to any Japanese ships in the slot. And uh, I can surmise that uh, between two experienced players, the Japanese player may surely know by now that that is a carrier task force because if he's counting carriers, he hasn't seen the WASP yet. So the WASP is in there. So the Americans, what they will do is they will move that carrier task force to the Eastern Solomons. On we go to the sixth Japanese operation. The Japanese will sortie the Tokyo Express, which is here, operation box six, and place it in the slot. And it is just one sea zone away from Iron Bottom Sound and landing at Guadalcanal. 
until the last American operation of this turn. So with a carrier task force in the Eastern Solomons, the Americans can practically do nothing against the Tokyo Express. They cannot launch airstrikes into the slot because the slot is not adjacent to the Eastern Solomons. So the Americans will pass. So we go to the last, the seventh operation for the Japanese in turn one. They could sortie this uh, pretty sizable bombardment task force, but they will not do so. Japanese will move the Tokyo Express from the slot into Iron Bottom Sound, and the Japanese reveal what is pretty obvious. It is a sole transport unit that comprises the Tokyo Express. It is removed from the map as it lands its soldiers in Guadalcanal. And that has the effect of shifting the initiative marker one box in favor of the phasing Japanese. And the initiative is now in Japanese hands and they have control of Henderson Field. The Japanese task force that was in Operation Box 7 does not enter play and we place it in truck face down. It's the end of operations for turn one, so we return all units on the map to their respective bases, and the only units remaining are those of the carrier task force, American carrier task force in the Eastern Solomons, which is placed in Espiritu Santo. Now, if the initiative marker would be face up with the operational side of Henderson Field showing, it would be shifted one space in favor of the initiative player, which would be the Japanese, and it would move into box two. But in this particular case, the initiative marker is face down. So it is flipped to its operational side. So now the Japanese have the initiative, and we move now to turn number two. The Americans receive as reinforcements the Hornet and the Saratoga that was damaged in turn one returns to the game. So we place both carriers in the American base, Espiritu Santo. So at the start of turn two, we begin with the initiative determination. As we stated, the Japanese have the initiative. That means that they control Henderson Field, which is operational, and the Americans receive both transport units. The Americans with the Hornet and the return of uh, the Saratoga now have four fleet carriers, three battleships, and ten cruisers. The Japanese begin turn two with two fleet carriers, two light carriers, six battleships, of which four have a surface strength of two and 13 cruisers, of which three have a defense value of zero. Here we see the ships that were sunk in turn one. Each side lost two cruisers. And the next phase is the events phase, which begins in turn two, with the non-initiative player rolling 1d6, and that will be the United States. And the roll is a two. The event is heavy bombers. And this is the only event that can happen more than once during the game. As a result of this event, Henderson Field is disrupted. So we flip the initiative marker to its backside. And again, a disrupted Henderson Field means that an amphibious task force can land its troops there. So we move now to the next phase, the task force phase, where the non-initiative player first forms his task forces, and that is the United States. So having Henderson Field start the game in a disrupted status means that the Americans save themselves from having to bombard Henderson Field with a bombardment task force. So the Americans will form two amphibious task forces. The Americans will also form two carrier task forces. So the first task force to be formed and placed in Operation Box 1 will have the Hornet, the Saratoga, the Chicago, the Minneapolis, 
and the Southampton. The Americans place this carrier task force in Operation Box Number 1. Next, the Americans will form an amphibious task force composed of the battleships Washington, South Dakota, and the cruisers Salt Lake City, San Francisco, and one transport unit. And this task force goes into Operation Box Number 2. The Americans form now a second amphibious task force composed of the battleship North Carolina, the Portland, the Chester, and the Indianapolis. And of course, the remaining transport unit, and it is placed in Operation Box Number 3. Finally, the remaining two carriers, the Wasp and Enterprise, together with the cruisers Pensacola and Australia, will form a carrier task force that is placed in Operation Box Number 4. Operation Boxes 5 through 7 are left empty. Now it's the Japanese player's turn to form his task forces, and in a real game, the Japanese player would be observing the American player as he places his uh, task forces on the operation box. And given this setup where each of the task forces has a, a closely similar number of units, it may be hard to determine which is a carrier task force and which is not and whether the Americans are placing both amphibious or transport units in the same task force or not. In any event, the Japanese want to uh, protect their newly acquired airfield at Guadalcanal, so they may want to invest in a strong bombardment task force that can reach Guadalcanal quickly. So the first task force will be composed of the battleships Mutsu and Nagato with the cruisers Aguro, Kumano, Chikuma, Maya, and Chokai. And this bombardment task force goes into Operation Box 1. The Japanese have the option of placing all their carriers, fleet and light carriers, in one task force or dividing the carriers in two. The Americans have four task forces, and here, as you've seen, every time you attack or conduct an airstrike with a, with a task force, that task force has to return to base. So the Japanese don't want to fall short in the number of task forces they can use to address the Americans in this turn. So they will form two carrier task forces, and the first one is formed now. And it will be formed with the Shokaku, the Suijo, and the Atago, Tony, Susuya, and Takao. And this carrier task force goes in operation box number two. Japanese now form a bombardment task force composed of the four remaining battleships Hiei, Kirishima, Kongo, and Haruna. And this task force goes to box three. The remaining ships, among them the fleet carrier Shuikaku and the light carrier Ryuho, form a second carrier task force that is placed in the number four operation box. Boxes five through seven are left empty. So we start with the first Japanese operation. In that number one box, there's a huge bombardment task force. And the Japanese have various options. As a bombardment task force, it could be moved to the slot that, of course, would announce to the world that it is a bombardment task force. Now, if we want to keep uh, the identity hidden, it could be sorted into the Eastern Solomons. But, of course, there it would be uh, subjected to air attacks and uh, would not be able to fire back. And because the Japanese have the initiative and they control Henderson Field, the bombardment task force can be sorted directly into Iron Bottom Sound. And that's what the Japanese will do. So we pick the first Japanese task force on the track and we place it in Iron Bottom Sound. And that's the first Japanese operation. The powerful Japanese task force already in Iron Bottom Sound, it's 
The Americans turn for their first operation. They have a medium-sized task force with two fleet carriers in their number one box. And the Americans will sortie with this task force into the only sea zone it can move, which is the South Pacific Ocean. And that's the end of the first American operation. We move on to the second Japanese operation and the task force in the number two box is a medium-sized task force which is a carrier task force with one fleet and one light carrier and because it is a carrier task force it can only sortie into the eastern Solomons. The Japanese on the other hand could move this task force away from uh, Iron Bottom Sound but it would defeat the purpose of why it was moved initially there. The second Japanese operation is a sortie by this carrier task force which is placed in the Eastern Solomons. Next the second American operation there's a medium-sized task force which is an amphibious task force and uh, that task force of course does not have a chance with what the Japanese seem to have uh, moved into Iron Bottom Sound. So the Americans have to choose between bringing in that task force or use their already deployed carrier task force, reveal it, and conduct airstrikes against the Japanese task force in Iron Bottom Sound. And that is what the Americans will do. So uh, the Americans declare an airstrike on the Japanese task force at Iron Bottom Sound and we reveal all ships. And because this is an airstrike only the Hornet and the Saratoga will be participating in combat. The defending Japanese task force will not be able to fire back at the American carrier task force. We start by checking the airstrike value of the attackers versus the anti-aircraft value of the defenders. Only if the airstrike value is greater will the attacking units uh, get a bonus to their combat factor. The airstrike factor, as shown by the number of airplane icons there, is four. Meanwhile, the Japanese have a seven ship uh, task force, none of which are carriers, so the anti-aircraft value is seven. There's no increase to the Americans' strength. Now we also note that the Japanese task force has a combat air patrol value of zero because it has no aircraft carriers among the ships. So the hits scored by the Hornet and Saratoga will not be reduced because of combat air patrol. So we go into the first round and we're ready to roll. We roll first for the Hornet. Uh, Hornet needs four or less to score hits. The Hornet <laughs> rolled a six. Nothing happens. Missed completely. So now we roll for the Saratoga. And the Saratoga also rolls a six. No hits on the Japanese task force. Now the defending Japanese declare that they will not return to base. They will stay for a second round. And the Americans also will stay for a second round. So here we go for the second round of air attacks on the Japanese task force. We start again with the Hornet. And the Hornet rolls another six. This is incredible. And uh, how, how often can you see this? Now it's the Saratoga's turn. And finally some hits. The Saratoga rolls a four. Four hits on the Japanese task force. And now we go to applying the hits to individual defending ships. The Americans will apply two hits against the Mutsu and two against the Nagato. And because the hits applied equal the defense factor of the defending ships, on the sunk table, the Americans need a four or more to sink each of these ships. And we start first with the Mutsu. The roll is a two, so the Mutsu is not sunk. It suffers two hits and it is removed from play. The Mutsu is damaged and because it suffered two hits, it will return two turns from now in turn four. Now we roll on the sunk table for the Nagato. Four or six will sink it. And the roll is a five. The Nagato is sunk. And this is the first battleship lost by the Japanese in this game. And now we check for forced returns to base.
the attacker has to return to base because this is the end of the second round of combat. We take the American Carrier Task Force and return it to Spiritu Santo face down. The defending Japanese task force also has to return to base because one of its ships sustained at least one hit. Actually, one of its ships was sunk. So the remaining Japanese ships return to Truk. And because the Americans did not sortie the task force in Operation Box 2, all of the task forces on the operation track move one space to the right. And that's the end of the second American operation. Now we move on to the third Japanese operation, and in the number three box, the Japanese have four battleships. And these can move again directly to Iron Bottom Sound, to the slot, or to the Eastern Solomons. And being of such importance, the uh, control of Guadalcanal, these battleships will move into Iron Bottom Sound. So we take the task force and place it there, not in bottom sound, face down. So the situation is again very similar to when we started these series of operations. The Japanese have a task force in Iron Bottom Sound. And now it's the Americans' third operation. The task force in the number three box is an amphibious task force, and uh, the Americans have not much of a choice here. The only place that that task force can move is into the South Pacific. Of course, the Japanese would not know if it's a carrier task force or some other form of task force. So, take the task force and it sorties into the South Pacific Ocean. Now we go to the fourth Japanese operation. and There's a, another carrier task force composed of a fleet and light carrier about to enter the game. Of course, the Japanese, however, do not have to sortie this fleet into the map right now. They have uh, a sizable force in the Eastern Solomons, which is their first carrier task force. And there is a task force of four battleships in Iron Bottom Sound. And in this game, the burden of the attack at this point in time falls upon the Americans. They have to regain Henderson Field. The Japanese declare that they will sortie this carrier task force into the Eastern Solomons. And now the Japanese, unknown to the Americans, have both their carrier task forces in the Eastern Solomons. Now we go to the fourth American operation and they have ready to enter the game via sortie a five-ship task force. It has the battleship North Carolina, three cruisers, and a transport unit. And as we see the situation here, that task force has to move uh, into the South Pacific Ocean. It cannot move into Iron Bottom Sound because the Americans don't control Henderson Field anymore. That's what it will do. task force is placed in the South Pacific Ocean. Now the Americans have two task forces there. Now we proceed to the Japanese fifth operation. They have no more ships on the operation track. The Japanese, of course, don't know the composition or the type of task force that the Americans have in the South Pacific Ocean. And uh, the Americans have the burden of trying to capture Guadalcanal. So the Japanese are really interested in sinking or uh, beating back whatever amphibious task forces the Americans have. On the other hand, the Americans have the burden of moving into Guadalcanal. So the Japanese also, as a strategy, could pass and wait till the Americans make a move into Iron Bottom Sound. It seems that none of their three task forces is uh, considerable in terms of the firepower it could deliver in a surface battle at Iron Bottom Sound. Remember, the only type of combat between ships in Iron Bottom Sound is surface combat uh, for two task forces, enemy task forces there. So by moving into Iron Bottom Sound, the Americans will cause surface combat with the Japanese task force there. So the Japanese will pass.
Now we move on to American Operation Number 5. The Americans have a carrier task force in the number 5 box, which could sortie and enter play. And here's the situation. The Americans have two task forces in the South Pacific. And uh, both are amphibious task forces. Of course, in a real game, the Japanese player doesn't know the composition or the type of task force and may believe that both are carrier task forces or one is a carrier task force and the other is a, a different kind of task force. The Japanese have a bombardment task force here by definition because uh, they don't have transports in this turn and uh, carriers cannot enter Iron Bottom Sound. The only way an amphibious task force can uh, land its uh, amphibious troops and take control of Henderson Field when there's an enemy task force in Iron Bottom Sound is by defeating the enemy task force, eliminating it in the first of two combat rounds. And that is highly unlikely given the composition of the American task forces here, the amphibious task forces, which have uh, basically one battleship and the rest are cruisers. So to try to confuse the Japanese even more, the Americans will sortie and enter this carrier task force and it goes also to the South Pacific Ocean. Now on to the Japanese sixth operation. And the Japanese have two carrier task forces in the Eastern Solomons, a bombardment task force defending Iron Bottom Sound. And there are two operations left for the Americans. So by now the Japanese may surmise that the plan is that in American Operation 6, some sort of attack will be made against this task force to make it leave. And remember, in this game, just by sustaining one hit, the defending task force has to leave. The attacking task force has to leave anyway. So the Americans, in their operation number six, will make some sort of attack, either an airstrike, or one of these task forces will conduct surface combat which would leave the seventh and last American operation to uh, move into Iron Bottom Sound for an invasion. So the Japanese know that their two task forces here are carrier task forces and they cannot move any of them here. So the Japanese will launch a preemptive strike against one of the American task forces at the South Pacific Ocean. Now, of course, I'm playing this game with full knowledge of the composition of each of those American task forces, so I'm going to randomize this a little bit, and I'm going to roll a die. The Japanese will attack this task force on a 1-2, to two, this one on a 3-4, to four, and this task force on a 5-6. to six. So we roll 1d6. And the roll is a 6, so this American task force will be the subject of an airstrike by this Japanese task force. And now we reveal both. And let's line up the ships for a closer look. And unknown to the Japanese, this is one of two amphibious task forces. Um, of course, a Japanese player in a real game can uh, take note of that because this is the first transport unit that has been revealed in this turn. So this will be uh, the first round of airstrikes. The Japanese have an airstrike value of three. The American anti-aircraft value is four, so there's no addition to the Japanese carrier's strengths. And uh, the, there's no combat air patrol value, so the uh, number of hits uh, caused by Japanese carriers will not be uh, diminished. So we roll 1d6 for the Shokaku. And the roll is a six, so Shokaku misses completely. Now we roll 1d6 for the Shuio, and it needs two or less to cause hits. The roll is a four, no hits either. So the Japanese miss completely and fail to cause any hits in the first round. And now the defender, Americans have to decide whether they leave or stay. And, and if they are lucky enough to undergo another round of zero hits, that task force can actually attack Iron Bottom Sound in the next turn. So we go to the second round. Now the Shokaku will roll for its airstrikes. Shokaku rolls a one, so one hit is inflicted on the American task force. And now we roll for the Shuio, 
And the Shui also rolls a one, so a second hit is inflicted on the American task force. Now the Japanese apply the hits. And note that the Americans will have to return to base anyway, so there's no use of applying a single hit to the transport unit. The Japanese applied both hits against the battleship North Carolina. So both hits are equal to the North Carolina's defense factor. So now we roll on the sunk table. A four to six will sink the North Carolina. But the roll is a one. So the North Carolina is not sunk, but it is removed from the board. And because it received two hits, it returns two turns from now. So we place it in turn box number four. So having conducted two rounds of airstrikes, we return the Japanese task force to Truk. And the American task force, because it sustained at least one hit, has to also return to its base. And it returns to Espiritu Santo. And now we move on to the American sixth operation. Americans have two operations left and they have their second amphibious task force here and a carrier task force also in the South Pacific Ocean. So with two operations left, the Americans have to make sure they cause this Japanese task force to leave or destroy it completely. So this round has to be used for that purpose. So the Americans will reveal the carrier task force and announce it will conduct airstrikes against the Japanese task force and Iron Bottom Sound. Now let's spread out both forces. The Americans have two fleet carriers, the Wasp and the Enterprise, and the Japanese have four battleships. And each of those battleships has a defense rating of two, as signified by the anchor symbols. The airstrike value of the attacking Americans is four, the anti-aircraft uh, defense value of the Japanese is also four, so there's no increase in the uh, strength of the American carriers. The combat air patrol value is zero, so the number of hits inflicted by the Americans will not be decreased. So we start with the WASP, and uh, for hits, the Americans need four or less. And the roll is a five, so no hits caused by the WASP. And now we roll for the Enterprise. The roll is a one, so only one hit on the Japanese task force. Now the Americans apply the hit, and it will be applied to the Kirishima. It has a defense strength of two, which is less than the number of hits. So only with a six on the sunk table roll with the uh, Kirishima be sunk. So the Americans need a lot of luck here. The roll is a five. The Kirishima is not sunk, but it is damaged, and we remove the ship, and uh, we place it on the turn record track. Japanese ships, contrary to Americans, if they suffer one hit, return two turns later, and that is a way of reflecting the superior quality of the Americans in uh, repairing damage. Now the defender declares if he is returning to base, and the Japanese will not return to base. So we now go to the second round, and the Americans have a choice. They can attack again that Japanese task force and Iron Bottom Sound, or the Americans can attack another target in a different sea zone, and they will do so. They will attack the Japanese task force in the Eastern Solomons with the second round of airstrikes. So that causes the Japanese to have to reveal that task force, and let's spread out the ships. There's one fleet carrier, the Shuikaku, and one light carrier, the Ryuho. So the Americans calculate first their airstrike value. They have four, as signified by the airplane icons on their two carriers. The anti-aircraft value is also four, the number of non-aircraft carriers on the Japanese side. So there's no increase in the Americans' strength. The combat air patrol value, however, is two. So we have to reduce the number of hits by two to a minimum of one, and that's because the Japanese have a fleet carrier in the defending force. So we roll first for the WASP. The WASP rolled a three. We have to reduce it by two for the combat air patrol value. So that's a one hit on the Japanese task force. Now we roll 1d6 for the Enterprise. 
The Enterprise rolled at two, we reduce it by two because of the combat air patrol value to zero, but there's a minimum of one hit. So the Americans inflict two hits on the Japanese task force, and the Japanese task force can fire back with an airstrike round of their own. The airstrike value of the Japanese is three. The American anti-aircraft value is two. So the airstrike value is higher than the anti-aircraft value. That means that the strength of the Japanese carrier's attack will be increased by one. That means the Shuikaku will hit on a five or less and the Ryuho on a three or less. However, the combat air patrol value of the American task force is two because there's at least one fleet carrier. So uh, the number of hits inflicted by the Japanese will be reduced by two for each carrier. So we start with the Shuikaku and a five or less is needed for hits. The roll is a three reduced by two because of the combat air patrol value, one hit on the American task force. Now we roll for the Ryuho, three or less will score hits. The Ryuho rolled a five, no additional hits scored on the Americans. Now we apply hits, the attackers apply hits first. So now the Americans apply the two hits. One is applied against the Ryuho and the other one against the Furutaka. Note that both uh, targeted ships have a defense factor of zero, denoted by the absence of the anchor symbol. That means that one hit is greater than their defense factor and consequently a sunk die roll of two through six will sink each one of these ships. And the Japanese will apply their sole hit against the carrier Wasp that has a defense strength of one. That means that on a four through six it will be sunk. Now let's roll for the Japanese ships on the sunk table. Uh, the Ryuho on a two through six will be sunk because the number of hits is greater than its defense factor. And the roll is a two, so the Ryuho goes down. And now we roll for the Furutaka in a similar situation. On a two through six, it will sink. And the roll is a four. And the Furutaka goes under. And now we roll for the Wasp. On a four through six, the Wasp will be sunk. And the roll is a three, so the Wasp is not sunk, but damaged. And we place the Wasp one turn from this one, and it is placed in turn number three. Now we return the task forces to base because the Americans used a task force to attack. That carrier task force is returned to Espiritu Santo. And each one of the task forces that were attacked uh, received at least one hit, therefore, they also have to return to base. And we place them both at Truk. We move on to the last operation of the Japanese in this turn, number seven. The Japanese have no task forces on the uh, operation track nor any to move on the map, so this is an automatic pass. And now we go to the seventh American operation. Americans will now move the amphibious task force in the South Pacific Ocean to Iron Bottom Sound. And this task force, being an amphibious one, of course, has a transport unit, which now lands in Guadalcanal. We remove the transport counter, and that has the effect of shifting the initiative one box in the favor of the phasing player, the Americans. So now the initiative is back to zero and the remaining ships return to base and we place them at Espiritu Santo. Now to the last phase of the turn, the return phase. If there would be any ships in any sea zone, they return to base, there are none. And the initiative marker, if it would be on its uh, operational side, the side that has the initiative would be able to move it one space in its favor, but it, it is 
on its disrupted side. So we simply flip the marker to its operational side. The game turn ends by moving the turn marker to the next turn, turn number three. So uh, in a real game, the game would continue with turn number three, but this is as far as we will go here. This concludes this video presentation of Pacific Fury. This is a two-player game, and I want to make the caveat that I played a playthrough, basically for the purposes of showing you the mechanics of play, but this is not a game that is suitable for solitaire play, and the reason is pretty obvious. There is a lot of important hidden information, like the composition of the task forces, and also the order in which the task forces can enter play. And because there are so few playable spaces, that order is critical, especially in a game like this, where any task force that is defending and takes one hit has to return to base. And also any attacking task force has to return to base. So having task forces at the end of the turn is critical for the player that is attempting to regain Henderson Field and having enough task forces to respond against an invading player is also critical. But then uh, that's where the initiative uh, comes into play. The initiative player has a big advantage in that the initiative player can observe uh, the number of task forces that uh, the non-initiative player has organized in his operations track and then can respond accordingly. So I hope that this video has given you a good idea of how the game plays and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.